Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this roundtable, and thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Lars Utenes. I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, and I have the privilege of chairing this session on behalf of the Tapestry Project, as well as the host, the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to colleagues at ICAD uh, for making this possible at the outset. And as the title, Sunder Bounds Without Boundaries, as the title is, suggests, our focus today is on how and under what conditions transboundary work in the Sunder Bounds may lead to transformative knowledge and action, and particularly in the, in, the, in the face of climate change and livelihoods uncertainty. And as you all well know, there's no shortage of research on both sides of the border in the Sunder Bounds in the context of climate change. So today we put the spotlight on what lessons can be drawn across these country contexts with all the similarities and differences that they bring. So we have a number of exciting presentations. Um, Tapestry colleagues will share some of their findings and we, have, we are very lucky to have with us three researchers who have done extensive work, both in the England, uh, Indian and Bangladesh in the bands, and who will offer their reflections too. So uh, just before we start, just a few, few housekeeping points. Um, reminder to ke keep on mute uh, when you're not speaking and please save your questions until the end or use the chat box in Zoom for any questions along the way. And if you have questions to particular speakers, then indicate that. Um, and now to give some opening remarks uh, on behalf of ICAD, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Salim al -Hook, who's the director of ICAD and professor at the Independent University of Bangladesh associate of IED in London, among many, many other roles. So without further delay, Salim, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars Soto, and uh, a good afternoon from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, I think I can hear the thunderstorm uh, next door, my colleagues in Kolkata. So, you know, we are having a, a transboundary thunderstorm going on right now as we speak. Uh, we are not very far from each other. <clears throat> so. It's a great pleasure for my center, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, to have been part of this very, very interesting uh, project called Tapestry, where we've been looking at both sides of the border and looking at the livelihoods situation, the impacts of climate change, and the relationship of people with nature. Um, and I think we have, uh, as Lars Otto said, this is not new, uh, but it is also new in the sense that climate change is making things a lot worse than they used to be. So the situation is, uh, the newness of the situation is the urgency that we need to uh, act in. We, we don't have time on our hands anymore. And in it, there are three elements of this uh, the title that we have of co-creating transformative knowledge and action uh, that I want to focus our attention on. The first one is the, uh, the notion of co-creation. Uh, and the co-creators in this case are the people themselves who are uh, facing the impacts of climate change and other weather related hazards, even before climate change, but now worse with climate change. And their ex experiential knowledge of dealing with the issue. I now, um, in the climate change debate and discussion uh, uh, arena, I've been working on climate change adaptation for many years. And we used to use the term vulnerable communities or vulnerable populations who will be vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. But I think as of this year, 2021, in fact, the second half of uh, 2021 in particular, uh, we should change our terminology because climate change is now happening. In the last uh, 72 hours with the flash floods in Germany and Belgium, the, if, before that, the heat dome in North America, and since then, uh, floods in China and, and uh, Bangladesh. And in fact, I was just watching uh, pictures of London. London is underwater right now, the underground. And so, you know, we are in a climate change world. It's no longer something is going to happen. It's happened. It's happening. And it's going to get worse. So now, these vulnerable populations everywhere, even in developed countries, are having to face climate change. And they are effectively <coughs> becoming whether they know it or not, or whether they even uh, know the jargon terminology, 
they are becoming adapted. They are adapting because they have to adapt. If they don't get killed, if they survive, then they're adapting. And so uh, I am now uh, promoting a terminology of local level adapters, local adapters. They are not just vulnerable communities anymore. They're learning to adapt. And we need to recognize their knowledge. We need to build on their knowledge. We need to give them whatever knowledge we have, which is like jargon terminologies that they are unfamiliar with. We have to present that to them and, and tell them that these are the words we use. Maybe you want to think about using them and learn to, from them the words they use and try to understand uh, the, the commonalities and the differences between the different words. So it is learning from each other. It's a two-way learning street, not researchers and experts knowing things and telling other people what they know, but learning things from other people and then sharing what they think they know that might be useful. Okay, so co-creation starts with humility, starts with recognition of other people's knowledge and starts by listening, not talking. Listen first, talk later. Uh, that's the mantra of uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of co-creation of knowledge. The second word I want to focus on is transformative. And again, you know, in the climate change adaptation world, which I've been living in for the last two decades, uh, we talk about incremental adaptation. It, that is very much the level at which we are today. But we are also thinking about, not doing, but thinking about transformative adaptation. What does it mean? Uh, how do we make it happen? And um, that to me is a big challenge. And I'll share a little bit of some thinking that's going on here in my country, Bangladesh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who currently also chairs the group of climate vulnerable forum countries, nearly 50 vulnerable countries. And one of the things that she did as she took over the, the leadership of this group for two years, she'll be the leader for two years now, is to um, suggest that we change our narrative uh, from vulnerable, which we've already done once, to resilient, but even from resilient, we change it to prospering. So we are now introducing in the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries, the concept of developing climate prosperity plans. The difference between the word prosperity and resilience is that resilience is managing and dealing with the risks and impacts. Prosperity is overcoming them and coming out better off on the other side. And that is a transformative uh, outcome. And the transformative, it's an it's aspirational outcome. It's not something we know we can do, but it's something we hope we can do. And we want to find out how we can do that. And the, the time horizon is a five plus five year time horizon. The first five years being investing in laying the foundation for transformation. And then the second five years is investing in doing it, scaling it up. It's not an incremental change over 10 years. It's you know uh, an incremental change for five years and then a leap forward in the second five years. So that by 10 years, we are leaping forward. We are transforming. We have a transformative uh, um, change. And I, I won't go into this in very much detail. Perhaps we could do a, another seminar on this at some point in time. But the third and final bit of this is the knowledge in action. The knowledge in action, you know, we are a research institute, I'm a researcher, but we are very much of the, uh, the active research uh, um, community of practice. You know, research for us is not writing a paper in an academic journal. That is simply uh, uh, insufficient uh, incentive. Uh, research for us is doing something with the knowledge that we create, the evidence we gather, the analysis we do, and somebody needs to do something with it, not us. We are not researchers. We don't do things. So we need a, 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 a companion, a partner who can do things with the help of the research that we are able to do. Our skill set is research. Our skill set is not practice, not doing things. So we need practitioners to do the action. They can be national governments. They can be local governments. They can be different sectors of government, the water people, the forestry people. And they can be local people themselves, farmers and fishers. But we need a partner to do action. 
And so knowledge and action to us is two sides of the same coin. One-sided coin, just knowledge creation is, is just insufficient. We, we do knowledge because we want to use knowledge and we need somebody to use that knowledge to work with us. So that is the sort of guiding philosophy that brings us to this partnership. And we are very, very fortunate to have found like-minded partners in this exercise. Uh, we've already done something together. We hope we can continue to do this beyond the project because projects are just a means to an end, but not enough in themselves. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, I, I think I speak for all of our partners that we want to continue this relationship. We don't want to finish it when the project finishes. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we would like to share what we have already gained in terms of the research we've done. Uh, so it's a great pleasure that we uh, are being joined by so many people uh, today in this uh, webinar. Um, we will be recording it and then sharing it later uh, as well for people who, who aren't able to join us live. Uh, our experience with webinars is that people actually uh, watch them. Uh, you get a bigger audience afterwards than you do live because obviously people's time is pressing and they don't always have time to join a live event, but they do find the time afterwards if it's an interesting topic to actually watch the event, uh, uh, the recording of the event. So one of the nice things about the living in this uh, uh, Zoom world uh, with webinars is that they actually remain a, a, a video recording that people can watch after the event later on. It's sort of a, a co-benefit, if you like, of this uh, 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 impersonal uh, video uh, uh, linkages in, instead of meeting each other over a cup of tea, uh, which is the bad side. We don't have that. But nevertheless, uh, there is a benefit in uh, having this recording and making it available. So I look forward to the uh, the presentations and the discussion. I hope I haven't taken too much time, Lars Soto. So let me hand back to you. Thank you very much, Salim. Uh, indeed, there are some positive side effects of COVID as well in, in terms of the webinars, online resources, etc. And thank you so much for your inspiring and wise words, uh, as always. So turning now to the tapestry projects, I'd like to hand over to a colleague at IDS, Professor Laila Mehta, who will uh, introduce that session of sharing uh, findings from the tapestry projects so far. Laila, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Lars Otto, and thank you, Salim, for those wonderful words. Um, it's been great to work with you and ICAD, and thank you very much for hosting this wonderful roundtable, uh, which is a great opportunity, and it's just the start of a dialogue. Um, so as you said, you know, these webinars are one advantage. Another advantage is that we can get colleagues across uh, Bangladesh, India, uh, without flying in this terrible age where there's so much, we have such evidence of climate change. So I think that's obviously another advantage, but hopefully we can all meet up for a cup of tea one day too. So just about the tapestry project, we're working across Bangladesh, India, Japan, Norway, and the UK. And we're looking at how transformations may arise from below in marginal environments in India and Bangladesh characterized by climate uncertainty. And when we talk about transformation, we're looking at wider transformative structural change, not the kind of incremental change or changes that can ultimately lead to maladaptation. So as we've seen in the last few days in itself, the impacts of climate change are everywhere and they're very, very difficult to predict, not just in Maharashtra or Bangladesh, but actually uh, even in Germany or London. So these uncertainties manifest themselves in highly variable systems and interact with um, other drivers of change. So our focus is on the marginal environments in India and Bangladesh, where uncertainties associated with floods, drought, cyclones, um, and uneven impacts of capitalist expansion are threatening people's sense of well-being and place. And they exacerbate the vulnerabilities of marginalized communities. So while all communities obviously now all over the world are affected by it, uh, I think vulnerable communities, because of his historic processes of injustice, are impacted far more. Also because the above has tended to control or manage uncertainty, which often tends to fail or harm vulnerable people. So our starting point is that while uncertainty is a cause for anxiety, we're looking at ways in which it can be an opportunity for transformation. So we're looking at these bottom-up processes of transformation that Salim already started talking about, locally-led processes. In our project, we're focusing on three so-called patches of transformation. So we're, we're looking at alliances between hybrid actors, local communities, NGO scientists, and state actors, and looking at how we can look at socially just and environmentally just alternatives 
based on local people's plural understandings of their own experiences of place. So one of the patches is the Sundarbans and our colleagues will present shortly, but just very quickly in terms of overall framing. I mean, we all know the Sundarbans as a biodiversity spot because of the, the tiger, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's also the so-called hotspot due to climate change and natural disasters alone since the pandemic started. There's been Cyclone Amphal, Yash, uh, and of course, COVID-19. So in the tapestry project, we're trying to challenge state dominated developmental trajectories that have been very much focused on infrastructure and have neglected the dynamic nature of the Delta and its multifaceted development challenges. And they've also neglected local people's own understandings and experiences. In the Indian folk, uh, Sundarbans, for example, a lot of the focus has been on conservation, on the tiger, really neglecting local people's rights and perspectives. So that's we're really looking at locally appropriate and sustainable options to expand livelihoods for local people while at the same time maintaining the integrity of the ecosystem, i.e. forests, mangroves. So today's transboundary dialogue is a great opportunity. Why are we using a transboundary perspective? Ecology and rivers no more no boundaries, uh, but these boundaries between India and Bangladesh have created something that is quite detrimental to the Sundarbans. These areas are very culturally similar, and even though the islands have only been inhabited for about 300 years, that's what officials say. People haven't been there very long enough. They have been actually there for a long time. And different groups of Muslims, Hindus, tribals, so-called tribals, have created their own syncretic culture, typical to the islands. For example, bone babies venerated by all. Though of course, there are changes to the system and our colleagues will shortly talk about the politicization and also the targeting of minorities. Disaster and cyclones don't know boundaries. Uh, going from recent experiences of Amphan and Yash. So while deaths are coming under control, we still need to talk about why is it that lands, livelihoods are destroyed every year or every few months. Of course, these communities bounce back, but is it fair that they have to pay the price all the time? And finally, it gives us an opportunity to look at national frameworks and the role of state institutions and planning. Bangladesh has been a leader in climate adaptation and the role of Salim and others have, you know, it's been really great also in promoting this locally led adaptation uh, focus. India has been far more top down. Um, and I think there's been much more of a focus on the green economy, et cetera, and a lot of marginalization of locals in the name of climate action. So I guess there's a lot that the two countries can learn from each other. And this is a great dialogue and really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Laila, for, for those reflections and, and framing of the session. So I now hand over to Mahmouda and Upashana, who will share their reflections from the tapestry perspective. Sorry, um, let me reshare it. Yeah. So hello everyone, um, I'm Mahmouda, uh, working in the Bangladesh part of Shundarbon under Tapestry Project. In this presentation, we are going to uh, talk about uh, the issue related to transformation, co-production and uncertainty in transboundary Shundarbon. Uh, so our today's talk will be focused on the Shundarbon, which is one of the largest forests in the world, uh, lies on the Bengal Delta. Here we are using the term transboundary Shundarbon because around 60% uh, of the forest is lies in uh, Bangladesh and the rest in India. And our interest on it, uh, on it due to uh, having some similarities as a unified Shundarbans, which uh, like uh, includes rich biodiversity, human nature conflicts, re resilience, but vulnerable communities, uh, transboundary mobile communities, uh, cultural practices like cult of Bonavivi and so on. Sorry, the slides isn't moving. So, however, uh, due to climate change and uncertainty, the Shundarban region is facing a lot of negative effects. Uh, it is uh, like now having at the risk of uh, coast flooding 
So far, nine out of 14 uh, highest fa uh, fatality cyclones have been recorded in Bay of Bengal, which has caused severe damage, damage in, uh, to human and uh, livestock lives and uh, properties in the region. However, the dual impact of COVID and cyclones further increased the vulnerability in both areas. In addition, in the uh, last few years, sea level in, the, in this region has been increased about 0 0.9 meters to 3.3 uh, meters, so which is expected uh, to be increased more over the years. As a result uh, of these events, uh, around uh, like, um, around like 162.879 square kilometers area in Indian parts of Sundarbans and uh, 233 square kilometers area in Bangladesh parts has already been um, eroded in last 30 years. Also, the agricultural activities are getting severe effect affected. Um, despite having so many similarities, the way Sundarban is managed in these two countries is quite different. In Bangladesh, Sundarban means the reserve forest, and in, in India, it means the entire biosphere reserve, incorporating human settlement. Bangladesh Sundarban is an ecological uh, critical area with 10 kilometer buffer zone. On the other hand, the Indian Sundarban doesn't have such buffer zone. The Sundarban of India is an inhabited of rural and urban population, but the Sundarban of, of Bangladesh is an inhabited of rural population only. Moreover, in Bangladesh Sundarban, there is no locality inside the Sundarban. All the settlements are in the vicinity of the Sundarbans and in the Sh Indian Sundarban part, people are living inside the Sundarban region. So yeah, in the context of uh, Sundarbans, uh, transformative means uh, to address root cause of uh, climate change, uh, reconstruction, uh, reconstructing indigenous knowledges and redistributing local resources and considering gender equality and sustainability uh, in line with biodiversity. Moreover, accessible to the poorest of the poor by challenging existing uh, power dynamic. And co-production is an alliance between the community and other stakeholders. It is a form of knowledge production based on the traditional tradition and science. It is an initiative that blends uh, technology with everyday experience. It helps in form uh, formulating participatory policies. It, play, uh, it also play a vital role in building up transboundary alliances in the Sundarbon. Now I would like to uh, request my colleagues Upashana to continue the rest of the presentation. Upashana? Please. Yeah, thank you, Mahmuda. Uh, hi, I'm Upasna from the Indian part of uh, Sundarbans. Uh, so, uh, so what my uh, previous colleagues, uh, Lash, uh, Laila, and Dr. Salim, and of course, Mahmuda has already told that, you know, that Sundarbans is always looking at with its political boundaries. So here we are trying to understand what is required as a transformative uh, challenges as transformative um, tr as transformation for the entire Sundarbans amid these climatic changes. So, what uh, tapestry has done so far in both the countries with the with the pandemic challenges for data collection? So, we are trying to generate the evidence of actors' experiences. Means actors means here we are uh, we are looking at the policymakers, we are looking at the implementers, as well as we are looking at the communities who are experiencing it in their daily life. So. Uh, we are trying to get their experiential um, uh, evidences on the climate change impacts and how they are dealing it in, with their in their daily life, in their actions, in their policy making, both through face-to-face -face research before the pandemic happened, and now we are going we are uh, collecting the evidences through a remote research techniques, different remote research techniques. So uh, in this process, uh, our main focus is 
the how how the transformation can be imagined not only in the climate change context but uh, in in also in the pandemic context because you know we we uh, most of us knows that you know migration is one of the big um, coping mechanism of the communities who are going towards um, in bangladesh the migration is mostly from rural to urban and from outside uh, the country in india the migration is interstate and definitely rural so this type of changes we are looking at we are also conducting uh, uh, action research with the civil society organizations who are mainly uh, the uh, building the alliances with different actors in terms of climate sensitive livelihood initiatives uh, we are looking at uh, we are facilitating this kind of um, you know intra and uh, inter sundarbans dialogue with various national and international experts and this round table is one of the um, out, out, output of that uh, we are we are having experts consultations uh, uh, on the ways uh, to transform sundarbans as an unified regions we will in future we will would like as the project uh, progress we would like to widen our participations from various various actors in transboundary dialogues not only the experts but also the community members the civil societies we wish to compare and contrast the adaptation mechanism as uh, dr salim has rightly mentioned that bangladesh sundarban is far uh, you know ahead in terms of climatic adaptations and they are thinking about resilience and prospective uh, uh, prosperous uh, transformation but in indian part of sundarbans it is a it is merely a state issue so it is still restricted within the uh, you know coping and adaptations how how we can uh, think about to you know disaster management so this this uh, contrast and comparison we, we wish to you know detail out in our through our project and of course um, we would like to come up with some recommendations how we can uh, uh, facilitate this trans boundary learning and challenges for an unified sundarbans uh, next slide please so major initiatives uh, in in from the from our emerging uh, findings so we have uh, tried to mapping out uh, uh, for for the major initiatives, it's like salinity resistant crops, uh, um, uh, maybe part, uh, participated in research and ownerships with technology informed information and challenges. There are a lot of initiatives, but what we are looking in this uh, in this informative in this uh, transformative initiatives is like you know what they are whether they are based on traditional knowledge and practice. Do they have potential to create alternatives for the uh, people? Do they have potential resource to be distributed across the various section of the communities and especially the poorest of the poor? Are they gender inclusive, uh, especially in the context of patriarchal context of both the countries? Or, and definitely it should be sustainable uh, through the, uh, though it's need for, for the research. Next slide, please. So majorly we, uh, what, what the challenges are coming up for this towards this transformative changes uh, all the initiatives, most of the initiatives needs a robust scaled up and uh, it needs an equitable distribution of the resources and to, to balance the existing power dynamics in terms of class, caste, religion and gender. And definitely it should be community led other than the community based. Next slide, please. So how, how we can imagine uh, the Sundarbans beyond its political boundaries? So we know that uh, you know, in terms of institutional arrangements, in 2011, Bangladesh and India signed an MOU uh, to, to conservation of the Sundarbans. But they, they have the team, they're, they're, there should be a joint uh, team, uh, jo uh, joint working uh, groups, uh, which met once in 2016 in New Delhi. And they have come up with lots of amendments, lot of uh, articles, uh, maybe six, seven articles. But uh, how far this progress has been done that uh, we would like to uh, see in our project so so that we can suggest something on a shared institutional uh, arrangements. So the Bangladesh uh, also for the transboundary learning, the Bangladesh has already uh, done a couple of initiatives, climate resilient initiatives in terms of livelihood which somehow failed, some are uh, successful, but this learning has never turned into a transboundary component, uh, which we are trying to focus in our research. 
so uh, in terms of incorporating diverse stakeholders we always work uh, in silos and definitely in terms of multidisciplinarity team or um, uh, even in implementations also so uh, we need incorporation of various embedded stakeholders including the community civil society policy makers and uh, practitioners uh, in 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 case of this transboundary dialogue uh, for decentralizations of that conventional diplomacy which both the countries uh, are having at present in terms of sundarbans uh, thank you so much so i thank will, you I will very much uh, yeah thank you thank you very much uh, mamuda and upashana i know it's a lot to fit in in a short presentation but you did very well indeed thank you so the next presenter is uh, Shibaji Bose, who will share findings from tapestry project work using the photo voice approach. Shibaji, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lash. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you who produce research done through participatory visual research methods. Through this method, uh, I will aim to sketch issues of vivencia, lived experiences, uh, representing climate change, uncertainty, and transformative action in Bangladesh and Indian Sundarbans. These visuals and narratives have been informed by participatory action research techniques, to visual ethnography, to engaging with children, to their paintings, and they're going to bring to you tales from the vantage point of women islanders of Sundarbans and from the children facing the dual impacts of COVID-19 and successive cyclones, Amphan and Yash. These methods have been facilitated by my ICAT colleagues, Mahmuda and Sumaya, and my colleagues, Anindita and Upashana in India. Next slide, please. The stories, uh, are told through uh, the participatory methods that have been collected since 2019 through a mixture of photo voice exploration during pre-COVID time and through use of remote techniques like digital photo diary and through children's paintings during COVID and are told through the lens of the communities about their social processes of their lives and livelihood and their relationship with nature. Next slide, please. In both the Sundarbans, uh, visual methods, uh, particularly photo voice and children's paintings, provide a wide berth to the community members to frame problems in ways uh, that are seen as relevant and appropriate to their knowledge and lived experiences. And we hope that the evidence from this iterative learning will provide new insights and perspectives and will thus combine scientific knowledge with lay knowledge. And that the co-produced knowledge from the method has the potential to trigger transformative learning of the AWAP to critic engagement and reconstruction of possibilities for action. The images that you see are uh, can you go to the earlier slide? Um, uh, one earlier, please. Yes, thank you. Images that you see are experiences of children in the forefront of climate shocks expressed through their paintings. The paintings show severity of flood, of pandemic and migrant crisis in the villages of Sundarbans which has led to multiple uncertainties in their own households and in their villages. The children through their paintings and accompanying narratives speak about their uncertainty, their fears, and their traumas. Next slide, please. The heterogeneity of the photo voice women groups, uh, their gender perspective, and digital photo diary uh, respondents those living by the embankment, uh, the landless, and landowners, and at lesser risk of flooding, 
and this and accordingly their pictures and narratives here uh, portray differential impact of the shocks in these pictures and seek to raise critical questions around embankment politics of displacement and compensation and larger issue of politics and power equations next slide please the through the uh, visual methods uh, and narratives uh the women have tried to systemize local experience and organize shared collective analysis of the relationship between degree of exposure and their social and economic position and its effect on the nature of migration post migration uh, of the households whose lands and ponds have been rendered unusable to youths who are aspirational and there is a picture of them uh, from new delhi and a twin strategy in some cases of the settled households who are beginning to combine uh, remittances from outside and also uh, uh, from the from the collect from the farming next slide please this is a telling story of migrants uh, ending up as urban poor in informal settlements with a devoid of the identity and well-being and often these migrants were the most affected during the covid lockdown and bringing unimaginable hardships in normal times too as the picture shows the squalor and turmoil existence from the ashad nagar slum in the outskirts of dhaka the common and the filthy toilet the common cooking area and perhaps in india it also mirrors the biggest displacement after partition of which sundarban migrants were also a part Unlike other regions in India, they came to face the wrath of Cyclone Alfan when they came back after the first lockdown. Next slide. Uh, this uh, is one of the uh, growing uh, alternate livelihoods uh, of scrap collection, uh, which uh, bring a tiny bit of succor to the women who are mostly living in the fringes of the reserve forest. It's a hazardous job filled with dangers of the crocodile and the tiger. and forest department who loath and harmonize this poor island as particularly in the part for getting into this livelihood and uh, they say that uh, we will rather take on tigers and crocodiles than the state through its forest department uh, their forest rights are completely seized by the state and in a lot of cases uh, have without being provided with any alternate means of livelihood next slide please the participants the women uh, have brought to their lens the work happening in transboundary transformative passages uh, when they were back to the wall and is a local level adaptation which uh, these are indigenous varieties with which they have learned from their forefathers before the advent of green revolution and the uh, yielding variety with high cost of pesticides these are low inputs and that have withstood uh, amfan and yash uh and uh they are and they are had been uh, proven to be going uh, at scale and there have been a lot of civil society organizations and oflate government also uh, trying to uh, provide uh, the market linkages for this produce and that is uh, very encouraging next slide please so we through this uh, narratives and photos we want to facilitate a transboundary space to hear the voices of the below that uh, we have shown in the last slides and to encourage more community policy makers interfaces on transmetic elements and liaising with grassroots civil society uh, research and movements that drove the uh, immediate issues through this visual methods we have been able to unearth this transboundary evidence uh, which uh, mirrors popular knowledge which has always been disqualified and subjugated and we expect to share the purpose production and use of transboundary knowledge uh, through uh, means in the coming days uh, through alliance building thank you so much back to last thank you very much to about the very powerful images and particularly those drawings from children that uh, uh, so at the, the outset uh, uh, on their experiences during covid very powerful and i believe they are being published elsewhere too so i think that's that's really 
very um, very good um, overview and presentation. So we will now turn to three researchers with uh, extensive work in the Sundarbans uh, and who will share their reflections on the potential of transboundary work. Um, and first up is uh, Professor Sumana Banjopadai, who is at the University of uh, Kolkata, who um, will share her uh, reflections. Can you hear me? Yes. My office is here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lars and uh, Professor Amit, for uh, Professor Haq for uh, inviting me uh, to be a part of this roundtable. It is indeed a, a pleasure because uh, I am also in a in the process of learning, and basically I was uh, I am I teach urban geography in the Department of Geography, but I have uh, started working on. Uh, you know, on uh, qualitative methods, primarily looking at uh, the environmental issues, ecological issues in uh, Sundarbans. And uh, while being a part of uh, one of the uh, very extensive, very large project undertaken by World Bank, which was uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the attempts at exactly what you are uh, identifying here on the transboundary research. So it was a, it was a, an experience which was very different. Of course, we did not uh, finally get to, you know, collecting the same kind of data across the boundaries. I feel uh, strongly after we had our sessions, our meetings uh, in our in our own project work, I strongly felt the need for this, uh, you know, transboundary sharing of knowledge because I understood, although I'm not an expert in salinity, uh, work on salinity and cyclones, that was an area which was uh, largely the focus because it was, uh, uh, the, it was primarily on climate change and vulnerability. So my work is uh, more on the human geography side and uh, economic um, uh, issues. So basically, I uh, I worked on uh, the issue of access to land uh, in large areas which are uh, majorly erosion affected belts, erosion affected pockets rather. And uh, uh, during the course of field work in these hamlets, which were uh, very, very uh, critically affected during the uh, during the Isla and subsequent tidal surges. Post Isla, what really happened in these areas is that even simple tidal surges, which were normal, uh, you know, uh, regular features in the monsoon period, that had tremendous, uh, you know, uh, far-reaching effects because it was already devastated by cyclone, uh, a cyclone of the uh, magnitude of Isla. So basically, I wanted to begin by saying that uh, it is a major achievement of our times that we are thinking about transboundary research exchange, transboundary knowledge exchange. And it is, uh, we already know that there is some literature already available in the benefits of cooperation by Madhu Verma and uh, uh, this uh, work that we did on the multidisciplinary uh, studies uh, in the World Bank project. And also joint, uh, there's, a, there's something called joint landscape narratives, I think. Which, is, which also brings about uh, some of these issues. So what I feel is that, you know, uh, when you look at climate change and you look at climate change vulnerability issues, uh, since Lars did point out that uh, we wanted to talk about gender, around gender and livelihoods. So I wanted to say that even during my field work, when I was working, uh, when we were looking at access to land, we were actually uh, exploring the drivers of land sale, the drivers of, uh, what are the drivers of land sale? What are the drivers of land purchase? And how these transactions, what these transactions meant to the community and how were they dealing with it in terms of, you know, the, that, uh, the, uh, the hamlets which were uh, completely washed out uh, during these tidal surges and uh, subsequent uh, cyclones. And the cyclonic activity as we, as many of you would, uh, all of you would know, is, uh, is increasing actually the frequency is also increasing. So the number of cyclones also, uh, you know, come uh, very uh, in quick uh, succession. So basically in this uh, context, uh, I was looking at, uh, while looking at uh, land access, issues of land access, I was also, also looking at how uh, women, uh, you know, women are uh, working in these areas. Basically when you look at uh, this huge stream of migration, out migration of, uh, of the men folk, uh, the uh, hamlet after hamlet, you find uh, women-headed households left behind with the challenges of 
earning a livelihood as well as their, uh, you know, the, the normal gender roles that we talk about, uh, the classification of productive, reproductive, and caregiving roles. So apart from these three major roles that they all they were already taking up, they're also now uh, driven towards, uh, you know, livelihood uh, options. They had to, they are forced to, uh, you know, go um, explore. Now uh, this, uh, and one finds that uh, this uh, there have been a, there has been a lot of discussion around the technological and engineering solutions to the disasters, which create the uh, increased or other um, award that uh, has often been used is the progression of vulnerability. So this progression of vulnerability that takes place in these areas in these regions, uh, these are impoverished regions, the most impoverished of the regions and also the ecologically most rich regions. So it's a, it's a kind of um, a, 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 a kind of re, a region where capacity building uh, on the basis of careful in, investigation of the roles, of the gender roles, uh, the roles of uh, their uh, productive, reproductive, caregiving, and livelihood related roles that need to be carefully investigated so that some capacity building can be created in these areas where the natural potential for community work by the women can be explored towards, you know, uh, uh, protecting the uh, population in the in the disaster in the condition of in the post disaster condition. So uh, we were basically looking at also the uh, this uh, progression of vulnerability, and I'm also in a in a different capacity. I'm also working on the uh, on the uh, tiger environment where we are basically looking at um, human tiger co-belonging vis-a-vis the conflicts also. So we are exploring the role of women in creating folk, literature, music, uh, uh, and poetry. And in this area, one aspect is to explore the narratives about their love, fear, respect, regard, worship of the tiger, and spite also for, uh, for, for a number of reasons. And especially uh, the plight of the tiger widows, and in this, I'm concentrated on these villages, uh, on the ex uh, villages exclusively for the tiger widows. So these are the areas which we were working on. And I really feel that uh, one of the areas, although I, I mean, uh, much of the literature is on climate change, like I said, started off with, that much of the literature is on climate change and vulnerability, where it's an umbrella kind of, uh, you know, uh, the focus is uh, on many different dimensions, including study of cyclones, coastline changes, salinity issues, uh, you know, land water complex, uh, 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 changing behavior of the land water complexes. But, uh, but there is another very crucial issue that I think, uh, this project has outlined uh, the whole idea of study of everyday lives across the two regions is extremely important uh, to create uh, what uh, basically Professor Huck started off by saying that, um, you know, uh, eventually we need to have solutions which are local based solutions. So these really, really focus need to focus on uh, capacity building at the local level, at the village level, at the people, at the level of community, which is affected community who know exactly, uh, who know their territory, who know uh, how exactly to deal with the issues, provided uh, there is some support from the uh, from the uh, governance and from the government and other institutions. That support is definitely required because uh, they are absolutely uh, left homeless uh, uh, during these uh, cyclo extreme cyclone events. So basically that is all I would like to say. And um, I, I feel that the need for comprehensive data across the two regions uh, on similar uh, issues, uh, identified similarly identified themes of research. And I was really impressed by the work that uh, tips, uh, the Tapestry Project has started off. And especially, I this is one of my uh, my favorite areas of work, uh, what uh, Dr. Shibazi Bose presented about the uh, visual interpretations. This is one of my uh, you know, very, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy this kind of work. And I'm really happy that this work has uh, started off, especially in the visual it's I know I there are visual anthropology and visual geography, both of which we are we deal with, and uh, this representation of narratives uh, and uh, their lives uh, through photographs and evidences through uh, through the documentaries are extremely important and relevant to look at everyday lives. 
uh, my uh, area of research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Um, excellent points and lots to discuss and, and reflect on, on from that. And um, just a reminder that we won't have, uh, please keep your uh, questions to the end of, of uh, the reflections and presentations. But if you have any questions in the meantime, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat box and uh, address them to particular people if, if, you, if you'd like. So next out is uh, Professor Kamrul Hassan at the University of Dhaka, and um, who will offer some further reflections from his perspective. Professor Kamrul, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, it's afternoon in Bangladesh in India. I'm, uh, I'm not sure about I mean, UK and Norway. Maybe it's morning. Yeah. So before starting my talk, I must say, I mean, I'm very privileged uh, to be here in this uh, roundtable session today. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me in this session with all these distinguished scholars, leaders, and guests. So I'd like to utter the, uh, the discussion topic. It is uh, Sundarbans Without Boundaries, uh, co-creating uh, transformative knowledge and action. So actually there are huge opportunities to work together, both Bangladesh and India for managing the largest transboundary mangroves of the Sundarbans. I would like to divide the collaboration scopes between two countries into four categories. First, uh, forest and wildlife conservation. Uh, second, uh, community development. Third, uh, climate change management. And fourth, uh, tourism and world heritage site management. So I'd like to have some background uh, for the audience who are not I mean, much aware of the dynamics of the Sundarbans. So, I mean, Sundarbans uh, is, uh, is a mangrove forest, which is uh, shared by the two South Asian developing country, Bangladesh and India. So it happens uh, like the forest is same, the ecosystem is same, but there is an international border between, I mean, uh, uh, the forest. So what happened, you know, I mean, the forest was much larger, maybe a hundred years ago. So, I mean, we have a high density for population density here in Bangladesh and India. So people started reclaiming the uh, land, I mean, by cutting, uh, cutting the I mean, forest. So they cleans up the forest and uh, take lands and they start living there. So what happened, you know, I mean, here in forest, I mean, usually in a forest we, we see, I mean, it's a forest vegetation and wildlife. So we have, I mean, forest uh, wildlife, as well as, I mean, a lot of people who are living at the edge of the forest, both in Bangladesh and India. And say they have very good relationship. I mean, they are very interlinked. I mean, I just I'm just gonna explain it. So the thing is that I mean, we know I mean the forest is highly depend on the wildlife. I mean, where the, where there is wildlife available, and wildlife also need the forest because you know I mean, in Sundar was the types of species we found we don't find it in the northern part of the country, in Bangladesh. So I mean, uh, the vegetation is different and the nature of the wildlife is different. We found here the, I mean, the famous uh, Bengal tigers in this forest. So there is an in interdependency between the forest vegetation and wildlife. Of course, you know these things. But communities also dependent on the forest. I mean, what the community do, they actually take their, have their livelihood from the forest. They, I mean, do, I mean, they catch fish from there. And now they start, uh, I mean, catching crabs. Uh, I mean, they have a lot of climate change uh, climate change project like crab, uh, crab feeding projects and sheep farming, sheep farming. So the community is highly depend on the forest and this community is very poor. Uh, I mean, especially in Bangladesh side. I mean, even it is true for India side as well. So what happened? I mean, they are highly vulnerable to climate change. And when there is a, an event like cyclones uh, or any other type of event, uh, so they, they don't have any, I mean, what I should say, they don't have any, uh, I mean, way of livelihood. So they start uh, depending on the forest and they, uh, they collect resources uh, and sometimes they involve in poaching. So that is a threat for the forest. But this forest is very important for them because this area is highly vulnerable uh, and cyclone prone area. And these mangroves actually protect them from the cyclones. I mean, from 2007, 2009, and last year, last, um, and last other, 
and few other cycles. I mean, there is a research uh, I mean, done by Mazda and his colleague. I mean, they, they said that the, these mangroves can reduce the tidal waves. So when there is a cyclone, I mean, uh, that uh, clears up a sea wave, I mean, a sea wave of one meter uh, crossing over 1.5 kilometers of mangrove forest is reduced to a height of only uh, 0.05 meter. So it can reduce the, uh, uh, what I should say, I mean, reduce the tidal waves. So that actually, uh, that actually, I mean, uh, reduce the harm to the community people. So there is an interlink, I mean, we called, I mean, if you consider uh, the forest and wildlife, so we think about the uh, ecological resilience. And uh, if you think about the community people and their livelihood pattern, their economic system, the socio-cultural system. So we have, I mean, another issue that is their socio-economic resilience. So both are, I mean, highly interdependent because I mean, if they deplete the forest resources that actually create a threat to their survival. And I mean, if the, uh, I mean, uh, and if the, they can, uh, uh, they can make the forest healthy and if they can protect the wildlife, so that actually have a direct implications on their life. So what happened there, uh, for the audience who are not uh, much aware of it, I mean, uh, government uh, of Bangladesh, uh, around 60 years ago, they built embankment uh, uh, in the periphery of the Sundarbans in, in many of the islands. So they start farming there. Uh, so what they could do, uh, they're starting farming there and uh, they start living from, I mean, they just migrate from different part of the Bangladesh and India. So uh, there was a, a, an environment like uh, they could cultivate their, their paddies and things. And now when we get, I mean, Isla, Sidor and Ampan and other, other cyclones, so often the embankment breaks and uh, they actually uh, carry the saline water inside the Older. I mean, the islands that is surrounded by, the, by an embankment. So uh, that actually create a new problem. So uh, sometimes it happens, you know, I mean, the people who are living at the age of the Sundarbans, they live, I mean, uh, I mean, 10, 10 feet below the water level. I mean, uh, as the silt uh, sediments cannot uh, uh, develop the islands of the Sundarbans, it actually start, uh, uh, I mean, feeling the river bed. So, I mean, there is a, uh, I mean, uh, water rise over there. It's not about sea level rise, but uh, it's, uh, it happens because, I mean, uh, I mean, people have actually created some uh, 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 actions against the environment. So, I mean, they have some different sort of dynamics. And now at this point, I mean, uh, from last 20 years, they need to cope up with the, uh, uh, different uh, climate change uh, impacts, like they don't have fresh water to drink, they don't have fresh water to irrigate uh, their uh, productions, and uh, they are facing a lot of floods uh, uh, that carry saline water inside their land area. They don't have grazing land, so they cannot have domestic animals that can eat grass from there. Uh, they cannot produce the paddies that they used to do earlier. So, I mean, if you visit some villages uh, at the age of the marginal, uh, I mean, at the periphery of the Sundarbans, you see, I mean, there's no tree. Uh, maybe you can see, I mean, a few kilometers from one point. I mean, if you stand in a, uh, stand in at some point. So that is actually happening there. So the, what they actually do, a lot of NGOs, especially in Bangladesh, they're working. They start uh, some climate change adaptation projects like mud crab fattening, shrimp, uh, shrimp farming, so they actually doing well, but the thing is that uh, that actually uh, uh, created uh, uh, some sort of infertility. So they they cannot I mean uh, grow the uh, grow the crop that they used to do maybe in few decades ago. So uh, that actually creates sort of imbalance. So there are a lot of climate change impacts there. You know I mean uh, so. The thing is that uh, the researcher actually uh, is trying to sort out uh, sort out the problem, how they can get rid of it. So some some NGOs and other agencies, including uh, including government of Bangladesh, even in India, 
I mean, we found they try to utilize tourism uh, as an avenue to get out of the problem because uh, it is a world heritage site, so it has a brand value to the tourism. And uh, secondly, I mean, you can we can utilize the forest and forest resources without, I mean, depleting or utilize using the, uh, I mean, the forest. Uh, I mean, we didn't need to uh, uh, collect timber from the forest. If you, I mean, use uh, Sundarbans, uh, 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 I mean, through tourism. So that that is a good avenue. I mean, to deal with these things. Uh, so, I mean, in, in Sundarbans, uh, I mean, uh, the forest, the wildlife, and community they are interdependent. So their ecological resilience highly depend on the socio-economic resilience and vice versa. So. Uh, a lot of us to uh, work together to and co-create uh, the knowledge. Like I mean, I found uh, when I actually uh, did my field work in uh, Indian Sundarbans, so they have some indigenous uh, knowledge uh, regarding I mean, so sand tolerant paddies. So I um, mean, around 50 years ago, they used to uh, produce some species of paddies, so that could I mean uh, grow even in high salinity. So when there is a embankment, so, so people actually forget about those species. So they, they have their uh, different breeds. So that actually, so Indian uh, NGOs are helping the people to uh, I mean, collect the indigenous knowledge from there. So we, I mean, we found that those knowledge are not available here. And in Bangladesh, we have some, I mean, some, uh, some technology, I mean, it's called ponds and filters. So one of the uh, NGO workers, he told me that, I mean, he learned these things from Bangladesh. So we have actually, I mean, between Bangladesh and India, we have collaboration, which is very necessary, but not sufficient. And another thing that I want to, I mean, to share, that is, I mean, uh, I mean it is told, I mean, uh, a lot of times, the Rampal Thermal Power Plant. I mean, there, it's a collaborative power plant. I mean, Bangladesh is importing the coal from India and uh, the electricity will be exported as well. Uh, but it will be at the age of the Sundarbans. And people around the world, they're actually living thermal power plant, th thermal power plant. And, and we know thermal power plant has negative impact. And uh, I mean, it's, it's like that. I mean, uh, I mean, government is planning a data economic zone there, which is very good actually, which we need actually, but we cannot compromise the quality of the Sundarbans. And I believe that Indian government should help in this regard. Uh, I mean, in Bangladesh in this regard, because you know, I mean, as you have said, they, the animals they don't know the border. You know, they all, I mean, cross the border with a visa. So I mean, if uh, some disease or some sort of problems they carry uh, to the Indian Sundarbans, so there will be a long-term impact on the Sundarbans. So that these things actually we need to think of, because if we just consider the short-term benefit, so that might uh, create a problem. So we have a lot of scopes actually. And uh, I mean, I emphasize uh, on collaboration. And finally, I want to say, I mean, collaboration in terms of co-creation and transformation of knowledge is a must. It's not optional. And it's important for the betterment of the forest vegetation, wildlife, and the people living at the age of the Sundarbans, both in Bangladesh and India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kamarul. Um, excellent point. Dependency of uh, people and uh, ecosystems and underpinning livelihoods and the uh, and the danger of simplistic solutions um, to to climate change and and the importance of looking beyond beyond the, the climate change. Um, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Camelia Devan who will uh, uh, also offer her reflections. She is based uh, or affiliated with the University of Oslo in Norway. Camilla, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, and many thanks to our colleagues for such an insightful presentation. And uh, my presentation does spin off quite well on uh, Dr. Kamrul Hassan's uh, talk about Rampal and embankments. So I'm an anthropologist and I've worked on water governance of embankments in Bangladesh since 2010, uh, when I was a research consultant for the International Water Management Institute. 
And my upcoming book coming out this autumn is called Misreading the Bengal Delta, Climate Change, Development and Livelihoods in Coastal Bangladesh. So this is based both on archival research from colonial times, because embankments have existed in this area for a very long time, um, or in the Delta, and then also ethnographic field work with Bangladeshi researchers, development professionals, and the everyday lives of rural people, including landless, divorced single mothers in the Southwest Coastal Zone. So I'm very deeply indebted to a lot of you here and um, uh, my colleagues in Bangladesh. Um, I just want to highlight a few key things because it's a very short amount of time to summarize key findings. But one is that embankments are problematic and most Bangladeshis know this very well. Um, but in West Bengal, Sundarbans, there are more calls for concrete embankments due to the smaller ones breaching uh, and with the increased floodings and cyclones that we've seen, especially with Isla, but now Amphan and Yas. Uh, from Bangladesh, we know that embankments prevent, prevent annual monsoon floods and the sediment, as you'll see on the top image to the right, it deposits outside on, in the riverbeds, raising the riverbeds. And so during the monsoon, what happens is that the water becomes trapped inside in these embanked areas called polders, uh, causing jolobodho floods or water logging, drainage congestion. So it's really problematic, and this is a key part of my research, that the World Bank and other actors are casting these permanent embankments uh, known to cause these problems since colonial times, mind you. Um, and uh, since also the 1960s coastal embankment project during the Pakistan area. So casting these embankments that have been along for a long time as climate adaptation infrastructure. Um, and actually there's a natural science study by our Bakheral that found that the unembanked Bangladesh Sundarbans gain elevation compared to these unembanked floodplains uh, that are sediment deprived. Uh, and they conclude that flood protection embankments cause a greater risk of flooding than rising sea levels. And this is something that West Bengali policymakers should take into account. Um, but how well can we compare the West Bengal Sundarbans, which is inhabited with the Bangladesh Sundarbans? Our colleagues have already told us from the tapestry uh, project how the different definitions are um, combined. So here I just wanted to highlight to the left is the shaded areas are embanked floodplains in the southwest coastal zone of Bangladesh. And to the right is a map by the late Hugh Brammer of the Ganges tidal floodplain. So my field site is uh, located between Kulna City and the Shundarbans. It's EBC, so Southwestern Ganges Tidal flood, Floodplain. And it is less saline than EBD, the Kulna Shundarbans. So the West Bengal Shundarbans are inhabited, but they also see more saline with less forest cover protecting it from the Bay of Bengal cyclones and tidal surges. And these are the areas in India that are seeing these talks of planned retreat, moving lots of people versus concrete embankments. Um, so through my work at IMI, we highlight the huge maintenance expenditure of embankments. Uh, so these are old publications from a few years ago, because Bengali Delta rivers, they meander, they damage embankments. Erosion is nothing new for this region. Embankments need to be repaired regularly, yet donors have continued to neglect repair costs while slimming down the Bangladesh Water Development Board and the Bangladesh's overall public sector since the 1990s through structural adjustment policies. So any embankment solution that's new must take into account repairs. These embankments will continue to erode, rivers and canals will continue to silt up and die, and there are risks of jolabodho or water logging increasing. So annual maintenance funds for repairing embankments, excavating canals and rivers should be key, but that is often not funded by anyone. Uh, projects are temporary, right? Uh, so the problem builds up. And mangroves so far seem to be the most sustainable in withstanding erosion, adapting to siltation and global sea level rise while protecting people and pro property from cyclones. And there are several uh, Bangladeshi researchers, including Ani Mishgain, Professor Dilip Kumar Dutto, and others who are proposing nature-based solutions such as tidal river management. And that means to remove sections of the embankments to allow sediment in and raise land levels during the monsoon. And this would be similar to the Ostromashi bans of the past that uh, we haven't talked about now, but it, these are basically temporary earthen embankments um, that was part of uh, 
uh, protecting mangroves from reverting back into mangroves, but enabling uh, monsoon agriculture, but then uh, stopping dry season salinity. So temporary embankments against saltwater intrusion during the dry season. Uh, but tidal river management has been tried in Bangladesh before in the 1990s under the Asian Development Pro Bank's KGDRP project. But there was no compensation to local communities. Uh, so any such endeavor has to look at the socio-political aspects of it. For instance, could rural employment through canal excavation work or universal basic income in these areas? But in any case, if we are to learn from transboundary knowledge sharing, the problems of concrete embankments in Bangladesh and potential ways forward in silt management could be seen as key considering current debates. Um, and also something I've been wondering is whether these poor embankments of the West Bengal Sundarbans, Anujale, Meghna Mehta, Dejani Patacharya have shared uh, very distressing images of the West Bengal Sundarbans also during these cyclones. Um, and that is if they're similar to Ashtamashi Bans and if they can be maintained annually for them to not collapse the way they have so far. And um, it's also relevant to look at how the early warning system works in the West Bengal Sundarbans compared to the southwest coastal zone in terms of evacuation and cyclone shelters. Um, and embankments breaching during the dry season is devastating for ag agriculture. But then again, a lot of you have mentioned crab cultivation, brackish aquaculture, shrimp cultivation. And to what extent are the many tiger prawn cares also damaging the infrastructure that we have against cyclones? For uh, during Isla, uh, we found that most of the embankments that broke in these care areas or uh, tiger prawn producing areas, they were due to illegal cuts and pipes in the concrete embankments in Shakir and southern Kulna. And I haven't seen any studies on this for West Bengal, but I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts if there could be a correlation. And in Bangladesh, um, as I write in my book, but I also see uh, Professor Shopan Odman here, so he's more of the expert of tiger prawns. But um, so in the book, I also write about brackish tiger prawn cultivation and how it reduces resilience and biodiversity. And uh, Kamrul Hassan uh, also mentioned the lack of uh, fertility. Look at these cracked soils. This is what salt does to soil. Where are the trees? And my, other, my, my field site was in two. I'm going over, I'm sorry. Um, so one had a grassroots movement and Andalon to stop tiger prawn. So lush, so green. And this area continued and there are no trees, no fruits. Um, so in terms of gender, if we think about reproductive work, uh, Brackish aquaculture is not sustainable in that sense, and it also risks threatening the structural integrity of embankments that are important in keeping out dry season salinity from agricultural fields. Historically, these areas have been able to be inhabited because of the embankments keeping the salt water out, not taking it in. Um, and in an upcoming paper, I problematize how migration from these tiger prawn areas where salinity ruins the land and weaken embankments, how such migration is now increasingly cast as climate induced. And if we do that, we can't address what is causing the salinity. And the article also analyzes artificial boundaries between reproductive, productive and caregiving work of divorced single women critiquing development narratives of women-headed households through um, anthropological attention and kinship. And lastly, to sum up, um, in terms of Bangladesh and transformative change towards prosperity, can economic development that hurts wetlands and waters like shipbreaking and the Rampal coal plant result in a prosperous Sundarbans with pollution and environmental degradation? How can we overcome the tension between economic development and environmental benefits? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Camilia. I think it was a, a very stimulating presentation and I'm happy that you ended on, on the note of a prosperous Sundarbans because that, that is um, reflecting back on what uh, Professor Hook said at the start, which I think it's all all uh, too easy to forget that we're talking more, about more than coping and um, that we're actually talking about pros prospering. But thanks for your reflections on embankments and the importance of uh, 
cross-border learning and sharing of knowledge and experience on this. So um, at this point, I'll op I'd like to open uh, the floor to any questions, comments from the audience. So as before, please uh, state your name and where you're from and we'll try to ask questions directly to uh, either to the to everyone in the meeting or to the specific presenters. So uh, and reminder also that you can put your questions in the chat box if you like. Okay, so um, so the floor is open if anybody has any questions. Okay, while uh, while people are, people are thinking, um, <clears throat> got a yes, Camero, please go ahead. Uh, I got a question from uh, Shoddar. His name is Shoddar Shofikul Alam. Uh, can I answer to the question, please? Yes, please. Can you re uh, re this question is like uh, what solutions, uh, uh, what solutions and specific actions are needed to overcome the problems in Sundarbans? I mean, the question is asked by. Uh, so, I mean, the answer is already given by Camellia. I mean, uh, we can apply uh, tidal river management and I mean, we can have some pilot project I mean, some part of uh, India or Bangladesh. I mean, here we can uh, have collaboration and we can learn from each other. Uh, so, yeah, that is, a point, that is a point. And another is natural solution. I mean, we have uh, quite a few embankments upstream of the rivers of Sundarbans. So, I mean, we can just, uh, if we can, I mean, keep it open. So that might, I mean, help to flow the water, uh, I mean, more naturally. So that can solve the problem better. I mean, yeah. I mean these are sort of, I mean, geo geopolitical issues. I mean, a lot of engagement uh, uh, need to, I mean, uh, deal with these things. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, th thanks very much, Kamru. So, um, any other questions, reflections, comments? Um, reminder of the the topic of of the roundtable, which is focused on transformative change and transformative adaptation. And I think, as several of the presenters reminded us, we need to look beyond the sort of immediate impacts of climate change, um, and we need to look at the sort of underlying issues. And Sumana reminded us about the land access at the heart of it. And Camilla and Sumana also talked about social differentiation, the gender aspects of it. Um, so there are a number of issues that needs to be tackled. And I think uh, I'd also like to, to go back to what uh, Professor Salim said at the beginning. Beginning, we need to. It's all too easy to focus on the vulnerability and forgetting the, the capacity and the knowledge of people. Um, it's also easy to um, to be, kind of remain in research bubbles and forget that we are in. We need to uh, need alliances with actors and and people who are acting on the ground. And um, uh, and uh, Upashana and Mamuda talked about the need for learning, and that was echoed by a number of the speakers. Learning institutional cooperation uh, across them, learning co-creation with stakeholders and also the historical perspective and the historical and colonial leg legacy indeed for that Camellia was reminding us regarding embankments and, and the problems they can create, which also Professor Kamrul um, highlighted. Um, so <clears throat> I can see we have uh, a couple of questions now in the in in the um, the chat box. So I'll, apologies if I miss any, but <clears throat> Manko uh, is asking um, a general question concerning the position that science and local experience in inverted commas are either incompatible of or have a hierarchical relationship. Um, and how does the transformative approach deal with this insistence? So I, um, anybody would like to, to reflect on that? Um, so that's the relationship between local knowledge and science, which is obviously, um, can be, uh, you know, uh, tensions in, in how you use and interpret that in, in, in a context where science is often the dominant uh, in terms of the framing and the, and the, the development of solutions. 
Okay, so we have also, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, the thing is that the problem actually, uh, the problem does local community actually suffering the problem. So they don't know much about the, I mean, climate change. I mean, why it is happening, what is carbon emission and how does it happen? I mean, they got problem and I mean, uh, I mean, over the generation, they have some their own way of uh, solving those problems. So actually what happened, I mean, uh, uh, sometimes it happens like the, from the governance level, we actually invite them uh, to utilize some technology without understanding the context. So, I mean, ignoring the indigenous knowledge because they, they have some knowledge to deal with these things. Actually, we don't know. We don't know much about it, but they have some knowledge. So, I mean, we need to, I mean, uh, know, I mean, whether it is good or bad. I mean, we need to identify from the facilitator's uh, side. So, I mean, if it is not, I mean, like, like uh, I mean, uh, for arranging fresh water. So uh, the NGOs are offering, uh, I mean, collect the rainwater. So, I mean, you know, rainwater that doesn't contain, I mean, uh, much minerals that a human being, I mean, need to have for their uh, healthy life, but they don't have any other way. So, I mean, in this way, they're uh, doing their life. So it is, uh, I mean, a bit challenging, I mean, to uh, make it compatible scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. And sometimes you find, I mean, the local knowledge, they are not non-scientific actually. So, I mean, it's a matter of study actually. Thank you. Thank you, Kamrul. I think that's an important point. I, I think, you know, if you're talking about transformation, a big part of it is to challenge those kind of uh, uh, hierarchical relationships that have existed and are still existing on between local knowledge and science and, and to create these platforms and, and areas where they can meet and, uh, and, and for co-production of knowledge ultimately. And Shibaji's presentation also highlighted that, I think, very well. So, Apologies to Shapan Adnan, who's had his hand up, and I, I only saw it recently. So um, please, Shapan. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have a few comments. Um, Camellia Dawan mentioned uh, that silt management, in a sense, was the key problem going ahead from now. It's very interesting because this actually goes back to the work of Professor Pushanto Chandra Mahalanovich in the 1920s, when he talked, when he went from his study of floods in North Bengal, he concluded that the, the key problem was drainage management and that embankments were not a solution in the long run. In the long run, whatever the short-term benefits, they were self-defeating. Uh, it is, uh, therefore, my question is, through your project uh, and your research, which is very important, uh, have you been able to come out with a clearer strategy on embankment construction vis-a-vis -vis water logging, which appears to be a kind of general pattern across this region? Uh, my next set of comments is about force migration, the causes of force migration. And this has been uh, touched upon by several of the speakers, um, though not, I think, very explicitly, but certainly land grabs are part of the picture, both in the direct sense. For example, when you had um, in the early phases of shrimp farming in the Kulna Belt, uh, uh, actual grabbing of land by shrimp growers, but also destruction or uh, damaging of the uh, water management structures so that um, salt water could flow in into the paddy fields, destroy the uh, freshwater crops and constrain the, the farmers to uh, hand over their lands to shrimp uh, growers. In recent times, we see other factors, which have also been mentioned by Professor Kamrul and others, the Rampal type interventions, uh, which um, not only affect the specific project site, but the entire uh, zone where the socio and environmental impacts uh, reach out to. 
And interestingly, around Rampal, you now have a growing zone, a ring of commercial uh, construction and establishments licensed by the state, even though the state talks about protecting the Sundarbans as a World Heritage Site. So you have fundamental policy uh, contradictions. I, I wonder uh, if um, your very promising research, combining researchers in India and Bangladesh, as well as from um, the rest of the world, could address these very key and long-term questions. They're not necessarily very new questions. As I said, mm -hmm. Professor Mohalan Obish a century ago dealt with similar problems, but in a slight, in a different context, obviously. Um, uh, but we need to get to address the problems of drainage management, silt management, the causes of uh, force migration, and the impact of external interventions like the Rampal and other commercial projects. Hmm. Thanks very much, uh, Shaban. Uh, very, very pertinent comments on sort of trying to get to grips with long-standing challenges in the con in a context where the climate is changing very rapidly indeed. So, so the, this is not to um, you know to focus on transformation needs to be everything needs to be tackled at once, which is creating uh, numerous challenges. Um, Camila, I, I don't know. If, uh, you want to respond to part of that question, which I think was addressed to you, uh, and I'd like to to ask other panelists if they have any uh, reflections on that as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Those are very important and big questions. Um, so, no, the, uh, I don't know Professor Prashanto's work uh, directly, but in the 1920s, 1910s even, there were huge critiques of embankments already. So for over 100, 110, 20 years, there's been a critique of permanent embankments stopping floods, talking about silted rivers and moribund delta and all of these things. So it's really sad to see how, and also with the flood action plan, right? All this knowledge uh, just keeps being undermined. And that actually brings me to Su Ming's question about knowledge, because what I've also written about in a shorter article called Climate Change as a Spice is that there is not really, I would say, a division between local knowledge and scientific knowledge, because we see Bangladeshi scientists code switching and compartmentalizing what they know of these complex historical Bangladeshi issues and their donor speech. And that is also, I think, sometimes a problem if we can't talk about the history of it. Um, so most of these waterboard engineers, government officials, they understand siltation and uh, water logging and how embankments are. So I actually, so that's the part of the article, how they switch narratives and say, holders are causing siltation and end up saying, but climate, Bangladesh is defeating climate change uh, and uh, we will, um, holders are great, great climate adaptation solution. Mm. You know, that's a huge contradiction in one speech. Um, so just to add that for the knowledge thing, but uh, in terms of a clearer strategy, I think as uh, and Dr. Gamal Hassan also mentioned was maybe tidal river management is a way forward if, if we can make it work by looking at power, sociopolitical uh, uh, inequalities and addressing it in a bottom-up way as a form of locally-led adaptation. Potentially, it's complex because, as you see, these embankments are cast lands. People live next to them. We can't remove them. It's not possible. They're roads. They're infrastructure. We've had them in Bangladesh for so long that we can't go back to the old system. But the question is, if India is building new ones, could they take into account what Bangladesh has learned? Um, so that is a question. And I think in terms of deforestation, to cut down mangroves now is not sustainable. We need that belt. So we've. I think that's something we need to try to fight harder for. And I did my fieldwork before Rampal. It was discussed with, about Rampal, but I haven't seen what is going on now. And I would very much like to do that for a future project because it's also the pollution of water coming out of that, no? Um, and what was the other question on forced 
migration, I, I think also in terms of using the term forced is difficult because there are several reasons why people migrate in this area. And we see this with COVID and healthcare. Coast of Bangladesh has barely any existing public health care infrastructure. And people are indebted and sell off land to save their family members with treatment. They sell off land to get their kids through school. Migration is also an important livelihood uh, strategy. Um, so, and it's the seasonal labor migration has been there for centuries as well. So I think we also need to be careful with this. There was another question here. I'll try to respond to them while I'm speaking to everyone else. Uh, I didn't see, there was something on climate change somewhere. Uh, how do you think climate change is impacting gender relations? Mm -hmm. And to be careful with what do we mean by climate change? What kind of climate change process are you thinking of? Are you thinking about rising sea levels, increased cyclones, or are you thinking about the salinity from these tiger prawn cultivators where they open up the gates of the embankments to bring in salt water? Because that isn't climate change. And the, uh, that is done by humans. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I'll stop there to give everyone else some time. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running uh, out of time here. So I wonder, uh, I can see there's been a, a lively chat as well. And I think most of the questions have been answered by colleagues. So thank you very much. Um, I wonder if um, if there's any final comments that you feel have not been addressed. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'd like to hand over to colleague uh, Mihir Bhatt at uh, AI DMI who will uh, uh, close the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, Thank you. Thank you so much, Lance, and all the panelists, and such a vibrant um, set of questions. Um, needs a whole new, whole new discussion again. Um, while I was listening to this, um, two things kept on coming to my mind. One was um, Tagore, and second was um, Salim ul Haq's uh, call for action. So the, the quote from Rabindranath Tagore, which came to my mind, is Re reality is the harmony which gives to the component parts of a thing the equilibrium of the whole and how we keep on separating the parts and bringing it together and separating the parts and that balance of uh, uh, doing it when we don't do it right, we end up with a situation where we have to look at Sundarbans not as in parts, but as a whole. And that's something um, came to my mind when, while we were discussing that it's important to see things in part, but also equally important to see that as a whole. And that's not perhaps done adequately um, um, in many ways. And that leads me to three very quick uh, action points that perhaps can be picked up by anyone here, perhaps and jointly uh, as a follow up to what is being discussed. And first is some sort of a unified status of Sundarban Delta system report would be useful. There is so much of data information inside and it's all sort of pulling it together as a unified Delta report to be very useful. And that's something I want to underline, you know, it can be covering ecology, employment and ecosystem or ecology, uh, uh, um, economy and employment. And that kind of report from time to time, three years, two years every now uh, would be very useful to um, track what is happening and what is not. And um, Shivaji Pai, it could be also done in an exhibition form with lots of visuals to do that. But some way of keeping what we've discussed in a, as, a, as a unified um, state of the Delta system would be very useful. The second is um, displacement and Delta dialogue. And a lot of this is related to displacement, related to Delta area, and some ongoing dialogue. Uh, across the country, but across the globe as well. There are other deltas we can learn from this as well. And that's something which would be very useful, focusing on jobs, citizens, and species, uh, not only human, but others. 
and that would be something quite interesting and useful to take off from this and it could be what I think Sumanadi said um, joint landscape um, um, drawing uh, joint landscape studies or it could be more in terms of daily life cycle what is happening on both sides and taking that as a starting point but that would be something very useful to uh, have and maybe could be started at UNFCC any other occasion the garden tapestry can decide the displacement and delta dialogue uh, jobs citizens and species would be very useful and third area which comes to my mind is a possible action research co-creation area drawing from what you all have said is related to recovery through adaptation a lot of measures are being taken by people themselves far more than by the public sector uh, in spite of the world banks in spite of the various government projects still people are taking their own adaptive actions the number of actions are far more the amount of money that they put in is far more effort that they put in is far more so how do you look at what's the impact of that what is the protection measures, how do you monitor and evaluate that kind of uh, activities, and how do you learn lessons from that, some sort of a system-wide lesson learned uh, um, effort would be good, and not only from this delta, but across deltas as well, and that's something Goboshna has also mentioned uh, quite clearly uh, towards the end of the discussion, so that's a third area that I think uh, it could be transboundary learning, it could be transboundary visual learning, um, starting from Ashtamasi Band, but maybe we can go further up as well. But that would be something very useful to take further for action in such combination. Uh, and I think all of this, let me sum up, will, will contribute towards the 2011 Memorandum of Understanding that Government of India and Government of Bangladesh has. So in a way, we are helping them refining and defining these things in a better way so that there is far better transformative impact of this MOU than what it may possibly end up with. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, stop there and give back to Lars Soto. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Mihir. And uh, a few minutes over time. Thank you for bearing with us. And uh, thank you so much to the participants joining today. Uh, thank you for all the panelists and thank you again to ICAD for making this possible. Thanks all and have a, have a good rest of your day and uh, hope, to, hope this stimulates further discussions uh, along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much.